climate change is here. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as a matter of fact, has given us 12 years to correct this situation. If we don't accomplish this, we're going to face catastrophic consequences. I don't know about you, but just saying that makes me feel overwhelmed, makes me feel helpless even. There's two things that we have to accomplish. And the first thing is that we need to quit producing so many greenhouse gases. Ten greenhouse gases at the last count that I saw. Of those ten, seven of them are synthetic. They're produced by humans. So maybe a little easier to control. But the other three, the big three, which is carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide are harder to control. We have to actually change our behaviors in order to achieve that. We can do this. We can totally do this. I'd like to talk about climate change with you 425 million years ago. And climate change back then was actually working in our favor. Of course, we weren't around 425 million years ago, but it worked in our favor. Climate change can cut both ways. Because you see, at that time in history, what happened was there was life on Earth. There were microbes of different types, but there were no plants. Plants emerged at that time, vascular plants. And plants do, well, they do a lot of wonderful things, but some of what they do is they respirate. They inhale and they take in carbon dioxide, and they exhale oxygen. And back then, carbon dioxide was really thick in the atmosphere. And not only that, but what the plants actually do with carbon dioxide is really interesting. The plants take in the carbon dioxide, they separate the oxygen from the molecule, they hold on to a little of the oxygen, but they return the rest of it to the environment, to the atmosphere. Then they take the carbon and they do one of three things with it. They'll take some of that carbon and they'll make cellulose, and cellulose creates plant structure. It makes a plant rigid, gives it stems, gives it trunks, gives it, gives it shape. The second thing that the plant does is that it makes sugars and it makes carbohydrates. And it's doing this to store energy in the plant. As a matter of fact, I happen to have brought one with me right here. It's beautiful. It's got solar collectors all over it and beautiful green. But the third thing that the plant does with carbon is that it takes some of those sugars and actually pushes them out into the soil through the roots of the plant. Now, we think of roots as anchoring a plant in the soil. We think of roots as pulling up uh, water and nutrients to make the plant healthy, and those are all true. But the plant also pushes sugars back out into the soil. And the reason that they do this is that they want to feed soil microbes. Because when plants first appeared on Earth, they realized that if they were going to survive, that they had to strike a partnership with somebody, and they chose soil microbes. What they needed was for their partner to protect them from parasites that would attack their roots, to help them find food, and to put it in a plant-available form. And there's actually types of fungi in the soil, they're called mycorrhizal fungi, that will attach to a root and then extend further in the soil than the root has, find the nutrients that the plant needs, and pipe it right back to the plant. But the third thing that they needed was that soil wasn't much to sneeze at back 425 million years ago. It was mostly mineral matter. And so they needed something that was going to loosen up the soil and create porosity so that the roots could move through, that water and nutrients could move through. Well, it was good partnership, and it's still going strong. Okay, I want you to fast forward to 11,000 years ago. What happened then was that humans, who had been on Earth for, for some time, 
um, decided that they got tired of foraging for food. It was a lot of work, and it was like, let's uh, try agriculture. As a matter of fact, we can probably create some food security in doing so. And it did wonderful things. It opened up, it made cities and societies possible. Um, it allowed people to pursue different, um, different venues, different... Um, we got artists, we got tool makers, because when you don't have to spend all your time looking for food, because somebody else is providing it, then you can specialize in something, and, and you can exchange services. So it really changed things quite a bit. The problem was that, in doing so, the first thing you have to do with agriculture is you have to have a plot to grow on. And so you get rid of everything that's growing on it. Trees, undergrowth, all those wonderful CO2 collectors that have been working for so many years are gone. The second thing that happens is that you have to disturb the soil. You're going to dig up the soil, you're going to cultivate it because you want to create the best environment that you feel for your plant. But as you're breaking up that soil, you're breaking up that carbon that was stored there for so long. You know, I like to think of carbon as a dog, um, uh, maybe like a puppy, like a, like a year old. You know, it's still full energy, and, and, but it's strong. And if you leave that back door cracked, even just a little bit, boom, the puppy is out it. And it's running out in the backyard, and it hooks up with a couple other dogs, and they're running the neighborhood, and they're knocking over garbage cans, and just having the time of their lives. Carbon is kind of the same way. Because when carbon is exposed to the air, it finds a couple of oxygen buddies, they reconnect, you now have carbon dioxide again, and it's out in the atmosphere. You've lost that soil organic matter, that carbon matter. Come up to the Industrial Revolution. Now fossil fuels are, are taking precedence, stepping up front. And step into the 20th century, and we find that agriculture, that farming, becomes mechanized. The burning of fossil fuels, Fossil fuels, ancient stores of carbon in the earth and the soil are now reintroduced. So we're creating even more carbon than we were before. As a matter of fact, it's to the point now that agriculture stands as the third highest contributor of greenhouse gases. This is a problem. There are technologies on the drawing board for huge equipment that will pull CO2, carbon dioxide, out of the atmosphere, somehow crystallize it and stabilize it, and, and then carry that off and stuff it into abandoned mine shafts. You know, carbon isn't bad. The problem is mismanagement of carbon. So let's do something else. Let's try something else. Plants capture carbon Microbes in the soil secure carbon. When carbon is in the soil, it's eaten by one microbe, maybe a bacteria, maybe a fungi, which gets eaten by something else. When that carbon is passed on to the next organism, that molecule becomes a little more complex, which gets eaten by something else, and it becomes a little more complex, and eaten and complex, and eventually what you find is that that molecule becomes so complex that it becomes stable. It's no longer something that can easily turn into a gas. It's not going to wash out of the soil. This is what we do with composting. We take organic matter, plant matter, and we make it irresistible. We, we, we blend it in such a way that bacteria and microbes just belly up to the bar with a fork in each hand, and they can't wait to dig in. And what they do is they stabilize that carbon. You know, compost changes a lot of things. If you take compost and you put it into sandy soil, maybe you live out near the coast, sandy soil is too porous. 
water just runs right through it. It doesn't stick around for the plants. It also washes out the nutrients that are in the soil, and they're no longer available for the plant. Well, when you add compost, it closes up those spaces. Clay soil, on the other hand, is just so tightly packed together that water and air can't get through it. So let's add compost to that. When we do, it's going to open up the spaces. It's going to make those nutrients available. Because just like carbon, and you may not believe it, clay is not a bad thing. Just too much clay is a bad thing. As a matter of fact, compost can even change mindsets, and I can testify to it. It was years ago, but my wife and I went to visit my sister who lives in Connecticut. So we jumped on a plane here in Eugene and flew out to see her. It was a great visit. And among other things, she had a vegetable juicer. And so we started pushing carrots and apples and parsley and all kinds of stuff through there, making big tankards of juice and just throwing them down, having the time of our lives. And then there was all the pulp that was left over. Didn't know what to do with it. I'm a little more creative with pulp now than I used to be, but there was no place to compost. She wasn't composting. It was like, well, do your neighbors compost? She said, no. I said, well, is there a community garden nearby? We can. She said, no. It's like, all right. We packed up the juice pulp, put in our suitcases, and <laughs> flew back to Eugene with it. <laughs> a lot of people are agreeing with the idea of compost and plants and being able to reverse global warming. The UN is on board. They feel it's the safest way. And composting is a, a simple technology. It takes very little infrastructure, so it can be done everywhere. And this has to be a global effort in order for it to work. Harvard University started managing one of their large areas, I believe it's 35 acres, organically, and in 2003, they started using compost tea. And what they found was that the turf got super resilient, the trees that were planted on the perimeter started getting healthier, and after the first year, they were able to reduce irrigation by one-third. That was two million gallons of water. Water is going to be scarce as things get hot. This is good technology for us to have. As a matter of fact, there's a place up above Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's called the Rodale Institute. They have an experimental farm, and they have the longest running side-by-side -side comparison of organic and conventional farming. Running the same crops, what they found was it, it's just about the same year to year. Uh, the yields are about the same until you have a year of drought. And when you have a drought season, the organic outperformed the conventional by 40%. It's holding water, it's holding nutrients, carbon in the soil. We need this. So you may be saying to yourself, I mean, if, if, if all this seems reasonable, it's like, why aren't we doing it? I would give the question back to you, why aren't we doing it? We can make compost happen on a large scale. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's, uh, you can start small at home. There's many different ways to compost. And you know, you, don't, you may think that you need property, that you need land. It's not true. You can compost in an apartment. You can compost in a condominium. You can compost in the closet. Different ways that you can do it all work. And then let's take this compost and let's implement it. Let's get it out into the soil. You know, there's a term, carbon sinks. The oceans are a carbon sink, but we don't want carbon in there. That causes problems, that raises acidity. Now, carbon sinks, we want to get it into the ground. Ground that is especially deficient in carbon, in organic matter. Dig it into your flower bed. Dig it into your vegetable bed. If you have a lawn, oh, what a wonderful carbon sink. Put it on your lawn. Put, put compost teas and compost on your lawn. And we can just keep scaling this up. It doesn't have to stay at the small level. Do you have a company? A company with a lunchroom. 
let's get a compost bucket out there so people can scrape their leftovers into there and we can get that stuff composted too. If you have a much larger company, ooh, if you have a corporate park with those acres of lawns, let's get that material composted and applied to that. It will save you money and it will take better care of the turf. It will take better care of the environment. As a matter of fact, if you are associated with government in any way, let's find some incentives so people will get excited and, and compost and get it applied. We can do soil measurements, see where their organic matter is. We can do this with farmers too. As a matter of fact, some farmers have already taken this on and they call themselves carbon farmers. As humans, we have distanced ourselves from the natural order and even feel that the actions that we take have no consequence on our world, on the environment. Perhaps the greatest benefit of composting is to reconnect us to the fact that we are intricately part of the mysteries and the complexities of the natural order. I look forward to seeing you all in 2030 and the stories that we're going to have to exchange. As a matter of fact, I hope to see you before then. Thank you so much. <laughs>